Hair has always had an important cultural significance for African Americans, whether it was the use of cornrows, box braids, or the quest for straight hair that followed in the early 20th century. The African American beauty industry provided an important vessel for entrepreneurship at a time when the African American workforce was limited, as well as offering up new openings for education in the African American community, crossing major and economic racial frontiers. This is how the development of the Walker system helped create opportunities in the early 20th century United States for the African-American workforce crossing a major economic and racial frontier. Slavery in the U.S. began all the way back to August of 1619, when 20 to 30 enslaved Africans were brought to the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia, through the use of the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage brought millions of slaves to the New World. In the process of this, the newly enslaved African peoples were stripped of cultural, ethnic, and linguistic differences. In addition to these people being homogenized, one cultural difference was taken away from them in their new lives as slaves. This being the different way African tribes and cultures styled their hair, which often included elaborate braiding. One important tool that was left behind in Africa was called the Afro pick and was used to style and keep the hair neat. Due to the tool being left behind, hair was often messy and later began to receive more damage due to poor diets, long hours of labor, and poor hygiene. The European settlers continued to turn to slavery throughout the 17th century, as it was a cheap and more abundant source of labor than using indentured servants who tended to be lower class Europeans. In this age of colonialism, one hairstyle slaves continued to wear in honor of their homeland was later named cornrows, after their similarity to the cornfields. Not only was this practical, but one's hair also played a role in how a slave was treated. If any texture or hair kinks were smoothed out to resemble a more European look, one usually had better treatment. By the late 18th century, the morality of slavery became an issue. The delegates of 1787 gathered to discuss this and whether slave trading should be banned or not. The court ultimately ruled that a slave should count as three-fifths of a person and that slavery should not be banned. Cotton had soon replaced tobacco as a new cash crop in America due to the invention of the cotton gin in 1793. Many people believed that the cotton gin would reduce the need for enslaved people, but it ended up doing the opposite by creating a higher demand for cotton. This would continue to the 19th century until the rise of the abolitionist movement, which called for the end of slavery. Tariffs brought from the North were hurting the Southern economy. These debates caused issues with the North and South, ultimately leading to the South seceding starting with South Carolina on December 20th, 1860. States continued to secede until April 12, 1861, when the attack on Fort Sumner began the Civil War. The Emancipation Proclamation was made official on January 1, 1863 by President Lincoln, crossing the beginning of a new racial frontier. Even with the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery wasn't completely outlawed in the United States until December 6, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was ratified abolishing slavery in the U.S., crossing a major racial frontier. In 1890, former slave Nancy Green was hired by the R.T. Davis Milling Company to help promote a new product by playing the stereotype of a Southern mammy. A mammy was a historical stereotype that depicted black women working for a white family as a house servant. In 1893, Nancy Green was introduced as Aunt Jemima, depicted with a head wrap. Head wrapping, which originated in Africa, soon gained a significantly different connotation in the U.S., this being due to the fact that head wrapping started to be associated with the mammy stereotype and popular characters such as Aunt Jemima being depicted with one. Instead of wrapping their heads because they enjoyed the style, black women, often former slaves, began to use head wrap to cover their balding because of their poor hygiene. Head wrapping began to be associated with being of a lower class. Around 1901 to 1904, a woman of low class named Sarah Breedlove, later known as Madam C.J. Walker, had been working in St. Louis, Missouri in poverty by working as a laundress and as a cook, making $1.50 a day, soon began to realize that she was losing her hair. This was due to the fact that in the early 1900s, indoor plumbing was a luxury. Due to this, washing hair was not a regular task, which left it vulnerable to bacteria, chemicals, and lice. Breedlove took pride in her hair, as it gave her a sense of beauty, and did not want to resort to head wrapping due to the negative stigma around the practice. Breedlove, looking for a solution to her hair issues, visited the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. In the process, she met an American businesswoman, Annie Turnbow. 
Turnbull's business began in 1900, at the time African American women tried to treat straight hair to conform to European beauty standards. By using such as methods like bacon grease, butter, and heavy oils as hair straighteners. Turnbull's interest in chemistry led her to create a line of products to help the scalp, such as the wonderful hair grower, and a product to straighten the hair called pullers. Pullers never really took off because of the way that they were dangerous and could possibly rip out already damaged hair by pulling on the hair to make it straight. She later moved to Missouri in 1902 to expand her business due to the city's growth in preparation for the World's Fair. Turnbull crossed a racial, gender, and economical frontier as she was one of the founders of the black beauty industry in the U.S. for her work in creating products that specialized for the hair of black Americans. In 1903, Breedlove was hired by Annie Turnbow in preparation for the World's Fair and began to work for Poro Company as a sales associate, learning the ways of marketing tactics. Breedlove continued to work for Malone until 1905 when she moved to Denver and met Charles Joseph Walker. In 1906, she married Charles Joseph Walker and began going by Madame C.J. Walker. The same year, she awoke from a dream where she said, A big black man appeared to me and told me what to mix up for my hair. Some of the remedy was grown for in Africa, but I sent for it, put it on my scalp, and in a few weeks, my hair was coming in faster than it ever fallen out. The product she later named Madame C.J. Walker's Wonderful Hair Grower. The product was her initial investment, and thanks to her clever door-to-door -door sales promotions and to her husband's help in tactics, she began to open up her first headquarters in Indianapolis in 1910, beginning the Madame C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company, a journey to cross an economical frontier. Walker became extremely successful because she was living proof of the success of her products. The beauty industry was important to Walker because she wanted to give black women a sense of beauty, even if that was by conforming to the straight hair beauty standard. Madame C.J. Walker created the Walker System, also known as a shampoo, press, and curl. The Walker System is Madame C.J. Walker's process to prepare the hair for the wonderful hair growers such as lotions, shampoos, etc. It consists of shampoo, pomade, strandless brushing, and finally, the hot comb. It is important to note that much of Walker's success was attributed by the hot comb, which was not invented by Walker, but by Marcel Gratteau, a French hairstylist. Walker's use of hot comb was significant and crossed the new frontier because she repurposed it to be used on coiled hair in a safe and effective way. The Walker system itself crossed the major economic and racial frontier by employing acclaimed 40,000 women as Walker agents in the proportional tactics similar to chains created by white companies of the time, such as Avon. Walker's organization and committee structures were quite influenced by the National Association of Colored Women's Club, which Walker became involved and later allies with through the members of her church. Walker was also involved with the National Negro Business League, an example being in 1912 when she attended the conference and interrupted it after being told by the founder, Booker T. Washington, that she would not be allowed to speak at the conference to promote herself. In 1913, Walker divorced from Charles Joseph Walker and kept his last name as it was the face of her brand and marketing. The two had argued over this because Charles Joseph Walker had played an important role in Walker's beginnings of the business. Walker ultimately kept the last name and later that year Walker donated a thousand United States dollars to the founding of a colored YMC in Indianapolis. Walker's work in philanthropy was extensive and usually went out to African American charities, recreational centers, education, and orphanages. Walker's involvement with wanting to create opportunities for women led her to found and support many beauty colleges all over the United States with her first one being founded in Pittsburgh in 1908, crossing a gender and educational frontier. Walker later met a beautician and educator, Marjorie Joyner, a friend and ally of Walker, the first black woman to graduate Chicago's A.B. Moore Beauty School. After Walker's death, Joyner joined Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Colleges in the National Supervisor and oversaw over 200 beauty schools. Dr. Mary McLeod, was another friend and ally of Walker, another educator, and another civil rights activist. By the time of her death, Madame C.J. Walker had accumulated a wealth that was well over hundreds of thousands of dollars, leading her to become the first recorded self-made female millionaire in the United States. The impact of the Walker system was also what helped her to cross a major economical frontier by allowing women a job in the process of giving them a sense of beauty. Now in the year 2023, hair and makeup still have an important influence on our society, with prominent companies such as Fenty Beauty and made by Barbadian singer Rihanna, and hair and skincare brand Carol's Daughter created by African-American entrepreneur Lisa price.